Well, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. We are here at the Spotlight interview with Dr. Sonsirai Alvarez Narvaez. We are going to be discussing their lab protocol article entitled Optimized Conditions for Listeria, Salmonella, and Escherichia Whole Genome Sequencing using the Illumina ISIC 100 platform with point and click bioinformatic analysis. Sansirai obtained her master's degree in medical microbiology at the University of Edinburgh, investigating the intracellular carbon metabolism of Listeria monocytogenes. Then she pursued a PhD in infection and immunity at the Roslin Institute and the University of Edinburgh focusing this time on determining the role of different extra chromosomal elements and the virulence of antimicrobial resistance phenotype of the animal and human pathogen Rhodococcus equi. Good, very good. Part of her PhD work was done at the University of Georgia with former collaborator, Dr. Steve Piger, who hired Sonsi Rai once she graduated as a postdoctoral fellow in the large animal medicine department, also working on Rhodococcus equi. During her postdoctoral fellowship, she became interested in bioinformatics and decided to complete a master's degree. She worked at the Athens Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory as a clinical assistant professor to help with the implementation of next generation sequencing for the diagnosis of infection diseases. Sansi Rai is currently working as a microbiologist for the USDA studying avian rheoviruses. So Sansi Rai, thank you so much for sparing some time to discuss your lab protocol article and the associated protocol in protocols.io. Mm -hmm, my pleasure. So can you please briefly explain what the protocol is about and how to use it and why it is relevant? So the protocol is about um, reducing the costs of um, next generation sequencing um, related to uh, potentially use it as a diagnostic, diagnostic tool in um, veterinary uh, microbiology laboratories. Um, and the reason behind it is because um, we realized together with um, other veterinary diagnostic laboratories that um, um, next generation sequencing was a tool that is, as we see the future in diagnosis, and um, we needed to start working for it, working towards that, that goal that is to implement this technique. And uh, um, when I started working for the Athens Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, um, my direct supervisor there, that was the um, head of the section in bacteriology and molecular um, diagnostics, Dr. Susan Sanchez, had um, a grant, a, a project uh, with other um, schools and other veterinary diagnostic laboratories across the country, um, subsidized by the uh, National Animal Health Laboratory Network um, that is part of um, the USDA. And with that funding, what they wanted to do is try to start um, implementing this new technique. So um, the version of the protocol before mine was basically a standard protocol that all these laboratories together across the country used um, in order um, to have something that um, they could use to sequence bacterial genomes for diagnosis and have comparable results. So if everybody has the same protocol, then I consider that um, what I do in my laboratory is not going to be different from what you do in your laboratory, what you do in, in your laboratory for in terms of um, the technique behind it, right? And it's something that we want for diagnosis because if my lab does it in one way and your lab does it in a different way, then how are we going to have some gold standards? Like, how are we going to know that um, my technique is as good as yours? So if, we'll, if we all get together and we really um, focus on putting something together, we thought it was like a really good way to, to start tackling this problem, this problem. Then when I started in the project, they already had this protocol. And the next bottleneck that we wanted to troubleshoot is reduce the cost. 
So what we did is we try um, different volumes of the um, um, uh, recommended um, reagents for DNA sequencing, but this particular platform that we use um, Illumina and short read sequencing. And um, we realized that we could reduce the volumes to a quarter or what the company recommends. So in this case, we're pretty much making this step of the process a quarter of the price that um, the uh, company is basically telling you. Um, and, and we thought that was really good um, because if we try, like if we bring the prices of sequencing down, then it may become more appealing for patients and for clinicians to start using this. Now, another bottleneck that we, we uh, describe or discover is that uh, um, in order to do the analysis of, of this data, um, you need bioinformatic knowledge. And not everybody has that. And in a diagnostic lab, um, most of the technicians that help in the lab that are the people that pretty much recognize, uh, oh yeah, this is E. coli from a colony because they see it every day, hundreds of times, um, didn't have the um, bioinformatic knowledge. So what we also um, add to the paper is not only a reduced cost in library preparation, but also a protocol um, in user-friendly platforms with like a nice interface. So technicians can actually do part of the analysis and come up with, we think this is the species that is causing the disease. And we think those are the antimicrobial resistant genes that this uh, particular isolate has. And then it can come to um, the clinicians and discuss with them and see if it makes sense with the um, clinical presentation. So it's a way to really also help um, technicians to do part of this analysis, especially the ones that do not have any bioinformatics knowledge. Thank you so much. I think that you can really <laughs> nicely elaborate why, what was the motivation for optimizing this protocol? Mm -hmm. um, and the drive was to reduce cost. Yes. And also to um, standardize the way that different labs across the country uh, perform the experiments so you can yes. set a whole standard. Yep. But, yep. Um, I would like you to tell us what was the motivation to have the protocol peer reviewed once you have optimized it? Um, for us, every time that uh, we go through, at least in my case, for peer reviewed is a way to prove my work. Um, I feel like as a scientist, we are really focused on our story, our research, our this is my model, this is what, what we do it, and it's awesome, right? And I feel like um, sometimes we forget about small things that could actually make sense in, in what we do or maybe improve the process. So to me, putting this um, for peer review is a way to get comments from people that are not familiar with my research to make sure that what I was doing is correct and um, it's valuable uh, for somebody else um, because I can see the value of what I do, but it doesn't mean it, it you know, it's, it's good for everybody else. And um, that was one of the main reasons um, behind it, yeah. And can you elaborate on this very specific case how the peer review process at PLOS One shaped the final version of the protocol? Really for the final version, I think that um, we, I think for certain things that I, because as I said, this is a modification of a previous protocol. So I think that there were several steps that were not clear in terms of how, um, I think it's like how much concentration, the DNA concentration at the very beginning and and how much we needed to add in the, each particular uh, part of the process. Um, and I think that having somebody else reading the protocol and saying, this part is not clear, can you please rephrase how you did it, um, really helped. And it also helped with, um, they really gave us ideas for like, how to improve this in the future. Um, so we have done this with a certain um, DNA sequencing technology that is short read, but now we have, other technologies available, uh, such as long read sequencing, that could be very beneficial for diagnostics. Now you have to understand that this is a program that started even before COVID. So it has been several years since we started and then pandemic, and then we continue with this. So right now there are other possibilities that we would like to explore. And it's some of the concerns that the um, reviewers, not concerns, but basically telling us, this is great. Have you ever tried this with 
you know, other platforms. And this is something that I would like to um, study in the future and to research in the future. That's great. Um, and now I would like us to add a little bit more color to the protocol by discussing what things you tried that didn't work. Uh, I know that you reduced the volume, the recommended volume to one quarter and that worked, but were there other parameters that you changed in during the optimization, but at the end you realized they didn't work and therefore they didn't make it to the final version of the protocol? Um, in terms of the actual um, protocol uh, for wet lab, library prep, um, I think that because somebody else did the hard uh, work of really come up with this beautiful standard protocol, we didn't really need to change much. Um, however, for um, the part of the bioinformatic analysis and the uh, different um, protocols to use in the different platforms, um, some of the platforms were better than others. Like some of the platforms, for example, Galaxy um, Tracker, um, which is um, an instance of the Galaxy supercomputer. Um, we realized that that was the best, the, the best platform and that gave us the best results. While other commercial platforms like Genius, although it's really good for like preliminary, um, pre preliminary data um, uh, filtering and, and assembly, it didn't really have the uh, programs that um, we will require in a diagnostic lab to come up with. This is the bacteria that is causing the disease and those are the antimicrobial resistant genes. Um, but I think that, yeah, because somebody else sweat before me and came up with this beautiful protocol, I just had to play with it with different volumes. And um, I don't think we, we went farther than reducing it to a quarter um, because in that particular, like the volumes were too small. Um, so going even farther that, um, I don't think that technically could have been possible. And I think that's why we didn't, we didn't decide to go lower than that. Um, yeah. And have you had to troubleshoot the protocol? And if so, why and how? Um, not really. Um, I think it was more, um, communicating with every laboratory because I think that this this um, project is something that we did with um, the um, Cornell University, um, University of Missouri, Mississippi State, North Dakota, Penn State, and um, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, I think that the most difficult part of this project is like to coordinate all these people that have their own agendas and try to say like, hey, have you done this part? Okay, cool, can you send me the data? I'm gonna pass you my data so you can look at it too. Um, to me, that was the only part that um, was slightly difficult. But in terms of troubleshooting the protocol, um, no. The only the only problems that maybe um, we saw, and this is like at the very, very, very beginning, is like um, um, no, not even then. No, um, I don't think we really troubleshoot much with the um, actual protocol. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, and can you tell the users and, and listeners uh, what are the most critical steps of your protocols? Um, I think that in terms of um, library prep, um, even when Illumina tells you um, the quality of the DNA and the concentration doesn't need to be great, the better your starting product is, the better your results are going to be. Um, and that's my recommendation. Like. If you start with crappy DNA um, to get the, your sequencing done, you're gonna end up with like crappy coverage for the genome that you want to sequence. So um, yeah, try, try to get a good sample to start with. Um, and then be careful with your pipetting, but that is always something, right? Like when you're dealing with like a small volumes and um, make sure that your pipetting is, is correct. And, um, and, and that's pretty much it. And then for the bioinformatic analysis, that's other stuff. So um, whenever you receive your data out of the sequencer, make sure that your raw data is good because it's another thing. Um, because a thing that you cannot control, maybe your machine didn't perform great. And maybe the reads that you have are not good and, and, and you don't realize about it and you have like contaminations that you were not anticipated and, and suddenly you end up with results that you were not expecting. Like, oh shoot, um, I thought that this was E. coli, but um, have hits here from influenza. And 
how is this possible? Is this um, just go back to your raw data and make sure that your raw data makes sense and it's good quality. And from there, start, start building and just recheck the quality of every part of your process. Like once you filter your data, make sure it looks good. And once your data is filtered, you do the assembly, make sure that the quality of your assembly is good. And then is when you can actually say, okay, I have the, the, the great blocks of what I need to give a diagnosis and to put a name on this uh, bacterial species and, and the genes. That, that's my recommendation. Thank you. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an expert in this field, but you mentioned that since publication, like new technology has emerged and you think that the protocol could be extended to, to these new technologies, and that's something that you would like to do in the future. But um, I would like you to tell us if you have started doing any work on, on that direction and whether your protocol, you have tried to either optimize or adapt your protocol even further from the point of publication. Mm -hmm. And in so, if so, how you've done it? Um, so, yes, I mentioned that there was this other technology available. It was, I think it was still out there when we started this process, but um, I think that now is when we see that it could be used for diagnosis. Up to now, there were not many, no many literature background regarding how to use this for diagnosis, how to do more than one sample for sequencing with this particular technology in long reads, but now it's becoming more and more popular. Um, and no, I didn't have the chance to really implement this protocol for long read sequencing. But what I'm doing right now is I'm working with the USDA and I'm not working with bacteria anymore. I'm working with viruses. That brings a completely brand new level of complexity, right? Because um, these machines are, are designed to sequence DNA. But you have certain viruses that are not DNA viruses, that are RNA viruses. Um, and, and therefore you need to adapt this protocol for that. And one of the main things that I'm doing in my current lab is try to adapt this protocol to get the most cost-effective um, avian rheovirus sequencing. Now, um, when you say adapting this protocol, absolutely, because before I actually start doing this protocol, I need to do some preliminary steps to prepare my samples. Think that bacteria, you put them on a surface, right on media, and they grow and you collect just bacteria, but viruses are um, obligated intracellular pathogens. So you don't grow them on a surface, they are just happy. You need to grow them on a cell. So when you extract the DNA or the RNA of that sample, like the viral RNA is tiny, it's a tiny proportion, right? So what I'm doing right now is trying to find um, preliminary steps before I do the uh, library preparation to get clean virions, basically, get rid of all the host RNA and, and, and all the host debris um, that is the actual cell where you need to grow your viruses and just come up with like the purest, R RNA, the purest RNA that I can get from avian rheoviruses before the sequencing. And um, this is something that we are really excited about and that uh, we, are hope, we are hoping that it's gonna get published soon. Um, and yes, it will be a modification of this protocol for viruses. And do you plan to publish this as a lab protocol or as a research article? I think um, we're pro probably to do both. I think we're going to do something similar to what we did with uh, PLOS One um, because um, I think it's really useful to have like a protocol that you can print and follow a step by step and like check I did this, check I did this, because in this um, sequencing processes are very long very long and sometimes when you write a, an article um there is no much space unless you add the protocol to like a, as a supplementary figure sometimes you you need to you miss some of these little things that you could actually write on a protocol that will help the user to really do it better or um i don't know yeah better is the word um those little ticks and um and, and i think i would like to do both like have it as a protocol uh, in protocols.com or something like that, and then um, have it on a on a plus, on a I don't know on a paper. Yeah. And but and also one of the advantages of you know of having the protocol 
not in the supplementary materials, but in a, in a specialized independent repository, is that these are versionable. So if a user wants to add a little modification, they don't have to write everything again. They just make a copy That's and they right. just tweak the steps. And the communication between the user and the author is very streamlined through yeah. the platform. So yeah. and it can be directed to very specific steps where you can ask, hey, how did you, I, I tried what you said, but it didn't work for me, or have you tried these? Um, so I think that's one of the advantages of having, of using repositories rather than supplementary material. Oh, a hundred percent. Like to me, um, I basically, that's what, what I did. I went to the old version of the, of the protocol and modify it with the new volumes that we were using. And that was very easy to do. It was like a question of maybe like 30 minutes switching things with my computer and I have the new version ready. So I see the advantage for sure. Um, so I think that um, having both, it's good because then um, also the um, new person that wants to use this, this protocol has a background of how it has been used um, through the paper. And then it can go really to the technical part that is what they are um, more interested on and not search for it on the paper. They can just go directly to a protocol that is step one, step two, step three, and, and so on. So yeah. I agree. And so before we, we, we finalize, I would like us, I would like you to tell us um, what has been the significance of publishing this protocol as a peer reviewed article for your career? Um, to me, I was invited to give a talk how to regarding this, this article. So I feel like um, because of um, maybe the popularity of it, we're not quite sure, um, right? How people knew about it, but I guess reading our paper and read and, and, and finding the protocol online. I got invited to give um, a talk at the um, American Association of Veterinary Laboratory Diagnosticians um, annual meeting last year. And it was basically to talk about this. They were interested in seeing like how can make um, this technology um, a reality in our laboratories, which are the problems that you face. How did you troubleshoot those problems? And can you please explain how um, we can do how, what you did and and that was great and and now I'm actually working at the USDA trying to do something similar so I guess uh, I just have found what I like doing as in terms of research which is um, play with bacterial genomes viral genomes and 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 try to make the um, the process of obtaining those genomes better and faster and most cost effective, I guess cheaper for everybody. Um, I really enjoy it. Sansira, it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Before we finally wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share that we haven't covered so far in this conversation? I think I just mentioned it pretty really, very briefly, but uh, this is not a project that um, it was just me and the Athens Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. Um, this is a project in collaboration with uh, many other schools and many other people. So I, I would like to give a, a big thanks to uh, Dr. Laura Goodman from University of Cornell and Dr. Sen Yu Shen and Dr. Shupin Zhang from University of Missouri, Dr. Li Fan Yang from Mississippi State University, Dr. Brianna Stenger from North Dakota State University, um, Dr. Ruth Nisley and, do and Dr. Uh, Mira Sudendran from Penn State and Dr. Elan Lin from University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Susan Sanchez for the, from the University of Georgia and my <laughs> former mentor, and the Athens Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory because it allowed us to really do this great work. So thank you, thank you for everybody that helped with me in this, in this process, thank you. <laughs>